seeds of today were planted in 1908, when 15,000 women marched through New York City demanding shorter working hours, better pay and the right to vote. The idea to make the day international came from a woman called Claire Zetkin, a name to embed in your brain and pay homage to every time you are finding the need to challenge. More on this year's theme shortly. Clara suggested the idea in 1910 at an international conference of working women in Copenhagen. There were 100 women there from 17 countries and they agreed on her suggestion unanimously. IWD was first celebrated in 1911 in the countries of Austria, Denmark, Germany and Switzerland. The centenary event was celebrated in 2011, so this year we're technically celebrating the 110th International Women's Day. At Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce, we are serious advocates for equality and strive for change. Marking today is an opportunity to bring you all together in one place to listen, discuss, inspire, reflect, and admire what you are all achieving in business, in life, and within your own personal setting. The theme for 2021 is Choose to Challenge. Reading the IWD welcome to this important event, this is what they say. A challenged world is an alert world. Individually, we're all responsible for our own thoughts and actions, all day, every day. We can all choose to challenge and call out gender bias and inequality. We can all choose to seek out and celebrate women's achievements. Collectively, we can all help create an, inc an inclusive world. From challenge comes change. So let's all choose to challenge. Throughout the next few hours, I urge you to support this 2021 theme by using the hashtags choose to challenge IWD 2021. Not surprisingly, IWD 2021 has already run up 7.1 million mentions on Insta. So let's see how we can raise the game today. When I researched the theme, it did make me think of my own family history and how women's lives have changed. I can trace a suffragette in my own family. I can trace women who really had to push themselves forward to perform serious roles during the Second World War. I know of relatives who've had to leave their career simply because they were going to have a baby. All of them challenged or tried to challenge the status quo. And this activism lies or lives on in my daughter and my staff as they fight today for equality, the planet, opportunity, learning, balance, and of course, each other. All of our speakers today demonstrate this spirit and so much more. Today will actually be hosted by our Chief Executive, Joe James OBE, followed by Holly Tucker MBE, founder of notonthehighstreet.com and Holly and & Co. And you will also hear from Karen Cox, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Kent. Each woman is a leader in their field. Jo was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birth Youngs in 2019 for her services to the Kent economy. She has worked in the business to business environment for over 30 years in a variety of roles, but has been specifically working at the interface between the public, private and education sectors for the past 13 years. She joined Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce in 1990, over 30 years ago, as a part-time typist and now heads up one of the largest and most active chambers of commerce in the Southeast. Jo will shortly be sharing her story of her rise to running a successful chamber and giving an insight into the many commercial roles she undertakes on various economic and business boards across the region. She'll be closely followed by Holly Tucker, famous for notonthehighstreet.com and of course Holly and Co, her consultancy that supports people to build a business doing what they love our last speaker is Karen Cox. With a significant background as a clinical practitioner specialising in oncology and community health care, or district nursing as we may know it, Karen will share her story from both the medical and educational worlds. 
Joe will introduce both Holly and Karen later and share a little bit more about their talks and of course welcome them to IWD 2021. So challenge for you, across the morning it will pay to listen very closely to each speaker as Molly has organised a simple quiz to keep you all on your toes. I can tell you it is a question about each speaker but that's all I can do and those questions will come um, at the end. I'd like to thank Molly for all of the hard work you've put into this event and to all of the staff at the Ever Hard Working Chamber of Commerce team. There will be an opportunity to join in the Q&A session at the end of the talks and as is now normal you can use the chat function to pose questions. I'm going to leave you with one thought. Whilst I was watching the many videos on social media to research this event, I came across one that posed a clear challenge. It's of a woman posing a number of her own observations. And one is that for each time she's referred to as a female entrepreneur, she would make the challenge that she's simply an entrepreneur. After all, she doesn't hear the title a male entrepreneur. Personally, I think she has something there. And personally, I think it's a great place to start to choose to challenge. Remember your hashtags, and most of all, just make the most of the morning and share back with Joe and the team how your challenges are working out over the coming months. Thank you. Now over to Joe James. Wow, 30 years. When I hear someone else say 30 years at the chamber, it makes me wonder if I've just been too lazy to go out and get another job. Um, I don't know where those 30 years have gone, but you know, good morning, everyone. And, and firstly, let me say how great it is to, to actually be spending time with you all this morning on International Women's Day. And looking through the guest list this morning, it just really confirms what I've always known. And that's what fantastic entrepreneurial women we have living and working here in Kent. So hats off to each and every one of you this morning. You're all doing an amazing job. But we all come from different walks of life and we've all taken different journeys to get us where we are today. And, and my story is probably a bit of an unusual one as, you know, I started working for the chamber as a, a part time typist just for something to do 12 hours a week and and wind forward 30 years and I'm still here, but as chief executive, you know, I often think to myself, how did I come from typist to chief executive? But probably more importantly, looking in the mirror, I, I ask myself, where have those 30 years gone? I think that's probably the most important one. But before working for the chamber, um, I actually trained and, and run a children's nursery, which I loved. And it fitted in so well when I, when I had two small children then. And without taking up too much time on, on detail, I had to give up the nursery because I had major surgery and I needed time to recover. And my husband then wanted to sort of wrap me up in cotton wool and look after me while I had treatment. But, you know, surgery and treatment went well and I recovered well. So I found myself at home with two young children. And don't get me wrong, absolutely love being a mum. But to be honest, I was starting to feel a bit bored. I don't know, like, if, if you're all probably the same as me, I always just needed that little something else as well as being a mum. And I remember opening the Kentish Express one day and seeing this tiny little box ad that said, typist, 12 hours a week. And I remember thinking, typist, I can do that for 12 hours a week. My husband won't moan at 12 hours. So off I went for the interview the same day and got the job. And really, that's where my journey began. What I didn't know at the time, actually, was that working for the nursery turned out to be the perfect background for working at the chamber. Because sorry, gentlemen, if you're listening, but I soon discovered that the only difference was the trousers had got a bit longer. So it was absolutely perfect. Um, the theme for, for today's celebration is choose to challenge. And that's probably what I've been doing for the past 30 years, particularly in the early years. It really was a case of breaking down barriers to be accepted into this unofficial men's club I found myself in. I think when I first started working for the Chamber all those years ago, 
It really bears no resemblance to the chamber you all know today. Back then it was just a town chamber covering Ashford. And there was four of us all working part-time, um, including our, our, chief exec our chief executive. And when I sat down to think about what I was going to say today, I have to admit, I really struggled. And those, that you, those of you out there that know me, and most of you do, being sure to something to say is certainly not me. But this time it was talking about me, it was talking about myself and what I've achieved. And, and that's never really been my style. Mine's been more just a case of get on with it. You've done that, park, move on. Um, let's get on to, to the next challenge and, and move forward. But actually it was my husband, as always, who said to me yesterday, be proud of what you've achieved, Joe. You know, he said he's proud of what I've achieved and so will my family. He said, don't be modest and blow your own trumpet. If after all, if you were a male, the noise would be deafening. His words, not mine. Um, he said, you know, you've done some real groundbreaking things in so many ways. You've achieved a lot and you should be proud of what you've achieved. So, you know, it, it's so nice to, to have that support from family. I, I just think it's so important um, as you go on your journey. But probably not the best idea as the question started flowing um, through my mind to, to, to start, you know, just type away with everything because, you know, 30 years of, of working for the chamber, there's so much I could tell you. Um, so so I, I sat down and started to try and put it in some sort of order. So, so where did I start? Well, I think my career as a typist only lasted a few months even if it was only 12 hours a week, you know, tapping on a keyboard, I soon discovered was just not for me. And I have to admit, I drove John Weaver Smith, who was my then first chief executive, absolutely mad over the first few months with my constant questioning. Thinking back on it, I, I was just like an, in, an inquisitive four-year-old. Why are you doing that, John? What does this mean, John? Why can't we do this, John? In the end, I think like most parents of an inquisitive child, he opted for the quiet life and, and just let me explore new things for myself, which I think I was very fortunate to have somebody like that. But probably not his finest moment, as the questions really started to flow then. You know, why don't we go out and recruit new members, John? That way we could really grow the chamber. And then I got the usual response, because that's not how we do things, Joe. Why don't we organise conferences and exhibitions and events, John? Because that's not how we do things, Joe. Why don't we advertise and promote everything we do, John? And people are nowhere here, because that's not the way that we do things, Joe. It went on and on. And I think in the end, I just wore him down. And that, because that's not how we do things, Joe, Joe soon turned into, I don't know, Joe. Why don't you just go and have a go? Which was really music to my ears. I had the freedom now to, to take a fresh look at things and was fortunate really to work for somebody who wasn't afraid of change, um, which I think is so important. And I think my 12 hours very quickly grew. Um, before I knew it, you know, there I was let loose like a child in a sweet shop, not really knowing where to start and could just see so much opportunity. And as I started to grow, I, I focused growing the membership and, and I don't know, you know how it, how it works. I went out there, great meeting people and I got lots of more members to the chamber. So I created a lot more work. So therefore they got me assistant and assistant. And of course, with an assistant to help me, I could do so much more. And before I knew it, my assistant was too busy. So they got me another one. And before I knew it, I had a team of people behind me. Um, and I think my official title, by the time I had five assistants behind me, you know, had now risen to a, a sales and marketing executive. And I remember my very first disappointment um, and I think that was when the board decided to bring in a sales and marketing manager. The, the job description was exactly what I was doing. Did I go for the job? No, I didn't. It just seemed not the right thing to do. I never put myself forward. I didn't have the confidence to do it. Although the job description was my job. 
So two months later, disappointingly, I now had a new manager and his name was David. He was nice. I liked him. He was nice. And uh, what did he do? He spent probably the best part of his work week reporting on what I was actually doing. And I think this was the first time in, in, in my working career that I thought, what are you doing, Joe? You could do that job standing on your head. It is your job. Why didn't you go for it? And I knew the only, re the only reason that held me back from getting that job was me myself, because I didn't have the confidence to go for it. And after six months, I remember sitting down. I remember it so clearly sitting in the room with David with our cup of tea and I was having my first appraisal. And he asked me, where do you see yourself, Joe, in 12 months? And I'm not sure where it came from or why it came out. But I said, doing your job. Not really the thing to say at your appraisal. But let me say, ladies, Eight months later, there I was, the new sales and marketing manager, as I gave David a thank you very much and uh, handed him his, uh, uh, all his belongings. He went off to a new role. And there I was now embarking on my route to management. I think that was my wake up call. And I don't know what it was. I think it was probably somebody doing the job that I know I could do. And the only reason I didn't do it was because of me and my lack of self-confidence. And I think over the following years, I, I continued to explore new avenues to grow the chamber. And as we grew as an organisation, so did my area of responsibility. But more importantly, what grew was my confidence, my confidence in, in my own ability and actually begun to, 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 to actually accept who I was um, and, and where, where I fitted in. And when I went to networking events, it was like seeing a sea of blue or a wake full of black suits, you know, tr trying to get yourself noticed in a real male dominant environment. You know, 30 years ago was not easy. You know, we, we think it's male dominated now, but 30 years, 30 years ago, it really was. And, you know, it was particularly hard for me, you know, when you think I'm only five foot. So, you know, it, it took quite a bit to be able to, to get noticed and, and standing out. And I think realising that society has become discriminatory in so many ways, I had to at least to start to challenge the status quo. And I think I think probably my first groundbreaking challenge come when I learned not connected with work, but I learned about the Rotary Club. Back then, it was a, a men only organisation. And the challenge, somebody was talking to me about, and they said, we've been men only since we were formed in 1802, whenever it was. And, and I could feel the challenge just rising in me. And I think it was just too tempting. Mind you, it didn't take me long. I think it took me about seven months. And then I became, the, I was inducted as the first female Rotarian. Now, it meant Ashford Rotary Club having to change their constitution to allow women to join, uh, but I managed it. So every Monday night, I tottered off at 6.30 to my men's club when my husband was at home looking after the kids. It was quite surreal, really. But over the years, I managed to encourage more women to join, uh, join Rotary. And today, you know, if I look at Ashford Rotary Club, there's probably an equal amount of men as there is women. So, you know, it, it was a challenge I took on. And actually, uh, I think it was for the better. And I think the men now, they all totally agree. It's so much better actually just having, uh, you know, men and women. But I think my next challenge was how to become CEO. And in 2008, uh, I'd had five different chief executives and I knew I could do the job. But again, I never had the confidence to go for it. So in 2008, I took my chance. The job came up uh, and it paid off and the role was mine. And I remember attending my first networking event in Canterbury and there was this man running around talking to the staff saying, uh, well, where's the new chief executive? I'd like to meet Joe James. I'd like to meet Joe James. And they brought him up and said, oh, uh, this is Joe James. And I remember his reaction so clearly. Oh, 
oh, you're a woman. I sort of looked at my assets. Yes, yes, I am. And I'm pleased to meet you too. I don't think I'll ever forget that. But over the next five years, the organisation grew from a town chamber uh, to a countywide organisation, offering support from business support to, to international trade. And I found myself mixing in different circles at a much higher level, um, yet again, a very male dominated world. But this time I have found my confidence. I realised that they were no, they, they were no better than me. I didn't need to feel inferior. Yes, I didn't know everything they knew. But then again, they didn't know everything I knew. So actually, we were quite equal. And I remember being asked to join the Southeast Local Enterprise Partnership Board in 2011. And then it was a board of 48 made up of businesses and local council leaders across Kent, Essex and East Sussex. And I would sit there, the only female yet again in a room of dark suits. Um, absolutely wrong in so many ways. But why fool today? And I sit on the board and I'm pleased to say that there are far more women sitting around that table today uh, than there was back when I first joined it. And when I became chief exec in 2008, I was one of only a handful of CEOs across Kent, across the UK at Chambers. Again, wine forward to today, and I'd say there's roughly a 40-60 split. So things have really started to move in the right direction. And now my job is running a countywide chamber with 31 staff, a chamber that has influence and power, and the influence and power to ensure that the right environment for business growth you know, is there in our county and also to challenge inequalities and inequalities where they exist. And, and that's something personally that, that I've tried to do. And as I mentioned earlier, my style is just to get on with it. But I've been fortunate that others have recognised what I've been achieving. And I remember in 2015, I kept it so quiet. You know, I was uh, nominated as a National Woman, a Woman of the Year. And I got to go to a big celebration of women in a swanky hotel in Park Lane. It, and, and there was women from all walks of life. And there was at this event, I was mixing with Sandy Toxtiff, Lorraine Kelly, Nicole Kidman. God, it was so surreal. And I have to say, the old imposter syndrome certainly came out again. You know, oh, do they know who I am? It, it, it's just me. You know, or I think that imposter syndrome does keep rearing its head. And in 2016 at the Kiba Awards, I, I was awarded the outstanding contribution to Kent. And I think of all the things that probably meant so much to me because it was being recognised for what I'd done by the people that worked alongside me. But I think my probably biggest shock came in 2019 when I was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours. And I think now the imposter syndrome really did rear its head. Me? Why have I got it? What have I done? But it certainly made me reflect on what I've achieved over the years. And actually, I was really, when I thought about what I'd done, I was actually really proud of, of what I'd managed to do. And I remember getting the letter from the Prime Minister telling me that I'd been awarded an OBE um, and saying lost for words, just just didn't come into it. You know, I was bursting with pride, but I got the letter. It was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Actually, it wasn't. It was a lot stronger than that. But this is being recorded, so I can't say it. But it was, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And after about the fifth, oh, my God, my husband went, what? And I gave him the letter and he looked at it and went, oh, my God. But he didn't. He said what I said. But we won't repeat that. Um, I think the hardest bit was keeping it a secret for around five weeks until it was officially announced at the Queen's, uh, the Queen's Birthday Honours list. And, you know, that same week, we actually went and picked up our puppy, um, our little border collie. Uh, and of course, ladies, it had to be done, didn't it? Yes. What did I call him? I called him Obi. Uh, people were asking me, Obi, oh, so you're a Star Wars fan. Um, I'd never watched it in my life. But obviously, when, every, when it all came out um, at the Queen's birthday, honestly, everybody knew now why he was called Obi. So I'm 62 now. Um, I'm not slowing down, but, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the end of my career, which probably we will be in about four or five years time. Um, and I do hope that, you know, I've made my difference in some way. Um, and and I think until I retire, I will continue um, to raise 
any issues and challenge where I see inequalities for women. And I was taught, if I was talking now to, to my young self, starting out 30 years ago, what would I say to myself? What would be the key things that, that I've learned that I wish I would have known then? And I think the very first thing has to be, if you don't have confidence in yourself and your own abilities, why would others have confidence in you? So be proud, you know, be confident in your own abilities, be comfortable in your own skin, and actually others will be comfortable with you and have confidence in you. And also, if you don't know, just ask for help. It's not, a, it's not a sign of weakness. Actually asking for help is a sign of strength. And I've learned that as I've gone on. How many times I've been in a meeting and said, oh, excuse my ignorance, but do you mind just explaining? You know, it doesn't make you weak because you'll find everyone else around the table doesn't know even. They'd be so grateful that you've actually asked. And one thing is don't speak just for the sake of being heard. Do your research know your subject and actually then you will be heard and be respected and I think another one is know your weaknesses and seek to address them and accept nobody is perfect I am far from from perfect as my family particularly my husband will tell you and I think importantly is know how to challenge without being confrontational because sometimes people get confront confrontational and actually all they mean to do is challenge and that never comes over well. And I think finally, what I'd say to you all is, you don't need to know everything. After all, life is one long journey of discovery. So yeah, that's my story. Um, I started as a typist and I've ended up as chief executive. It's been fun along the way. Um, I have enjoyed it. I think I had about, 15 different roles within the chamber I've done every job there is here so you know I, I think I'm well and truly a sticker rock break me in half and it will have chamber of commerce all the way through but yeah I know who I am now you know I, I'm 62 if, if, if I don't it'd be a problem but you know I know who I am now I feel confident in myself um, and, my, and my abilities and I think that gives me a much more considered outlook um, on life uh, and a different approach so all be proud um, of what you've achieved know where you want to go and take it in your stride so that's my journey so um, we'll probably do any questions um, at the end if anybody's got any questions that they want to ask me uh, because I might have waffled on a little bit too much so um, I'm now going to hand over to um, our next speaker which is Holly Tucker MBE, founder of notonthehighstreet.com and Holly and Co. Normally when you're introducing a speaker you say a little bit about them but actually as Holly's going to be talking about her journey um, I will just leave it there and hand over to you Holly. Hi everyone, nice to see you all, happy International Women's Day, can you all hear me? Thumbs up, yes, good, great. Um, I'm very honoured to be, have been asked to speak today on such a momentous day um, and hopefully what I'm going to do is to share a little bit about my story but also um, a few lessons that I've learned along the, the way. Now I'm going to share screen so you're all going to see how many tabs I've got open at one time so if we can just all close our eyes for one second while I just do this um, because it's my son always wonders how I actually cope with so many tabs open. I'm like, this is called busy women, isn't it? Um, right, here we go. Um, so, as I said, happy International Women's Day. Um, I have, um, I think that basically, uh, very much like Joan, I feel like I found my place in the world as well. Um, I'm 40 four in a in a week's time um, and I feel like I've been put really on the planet to try and help inspire people um, to be the fullest versions of themselves um, 
that wasn't always the way. I think we all find ourselves during this journey, don't we? And here are just a few snapshot shots of myself, uh, far left, or I don't know if the screen's rever you know, reversed itself. There's me in my personalized bedding. Little did I know that that category on Notton High Street would be a nice bestseller for me, but this was actually my mum who created personalized bedding. Um, so it must have been literally inbuilt in me. In the middle, um, the, uh, the dear queen, who I think has probably been having quite a rough International Women's Day today, uh, looking at the news. Um, I was head girl of uh, my school. Uh, I wasn't goody two shoes though. A year before this, I was nearly expelled for a rather disastrous school disco and involving a swimming pool. Let's just leave it like that. Um, and I was also young engineer of the year um, I'd actually invented the recycling bin um, and thank crikey my bin career didn't take off even though I wanted it to it actually didn't but it was a great lesson of you know being put out there uh, bottom right is my first day at my first job, um, I went to University of Life, which is advertising after the 80s. Um, and I was 17 years old when I started my first job. Um, the actual day I got my first job was the day that I got my A-level results. Um, and so I sort of didn't look back. And that little girl that looks very sort of angelic there actually had a nickname of Holly Hurricane um, because I'm rather in a hurry. And I still think I am at even 44, probably slightly less uh, than a toddler. I was in such a hurry um, that actually, and probably lots of you who maybe have daughters who feel sort of similar in energy, I sort of hurried into lots of things in my life. Um, and I hurried into a marriage. Uh, I got engaged at the age of 21 to my childhood sweetheart of 11 years. Um, and uh, yes, it all went a bit disastrously wrong. At 23, I found out um, not only did I have a brain tumour, which was um, treatable and I'm OK, um, it, but it did turn my world upside down. I also found myself getting divorced at the age of 23. And I'd been in such a hurry that I decided um, to slow things down. Well, I actually had to slow things down is down and I went into the world of creativity which was something that I was interested in uh, when I was at school um, and I started creating um, vegetable wreaths which is something that I um, you know I, I often talk about because it's not the sexy beginning that you'd like to you know it's it's not like a male beginning, you know, starting deliveries, found a gap in the market. I actually just made vegetable wreaths to help my mental health. And I wanted to sell them at the local fair at Christmas time, found out there wasn't a local fair, thought how hard would it be to make a fair that I could sell the vegetable wreaths at, which is exactly what I did. And I um, sold my wreaths. It was all amazing. And then I decided, oh my goodness, I'm going to quit my job at the time and I'm going to go into the fair industry where I'm going to bring together lots of small businesses under one roof, which was at this picture here, the Fulham Town Hall roof. And I did this for a couple of years. It was amazing because I got to meet so many incredible small businesses. This is me. And um, the reason I don't know why it was a tiger. Um, I just think that the cost of the tiger outfit was half the cost of anything that was actually um, even relevant of, at the time. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so that's me handing out my leaflets. That was my first marketing uh, job. And I put on these fairs and it was incredible. But as you can imagine, the town hall was not the best place for small businesses. So I decided that actually um, I... I in this time, I found my lovely now husband. I got married in lockdown um, and I've been together with him 18 years and we decided to get married in lockdown. And um, at this point, I had a three month old baby um, boy, Harry, and I decided not to give up on the idea of bringing small businesses together. But what I did know is it couldn't be a town hall roof. So I built um, now what is not on the high street with Sophie, my business partner, um, and really Really, you know, the last 16 years has been unbelievable, as you can imagine. Um, we've been able to, well, help over 5,000 small businesses. Uh, 
they hire in turn over 10,000 people. We've been able to make 200 one million pound business partners in that time. Um, and incredibly last year, we pumped um, cumulatively one billion pounds into the UK economy on this journey. Little did I know when I first made that first phone call to try and ask a small business to join Not on High Street. And they asked me if they needed a computer and a printer to join not on the high street.com. Because if you think about it, in 2005, 2006, we were one of the only marketplaces out there um, outside of eBay and Amazon. And we had no idea. That's why I always think naivety gets a bad rap. I think it's fantastic to be naive in business. Um, what I've realized though, um, during that experience and now building Holly & Co is, um, that ultimately, as Joe said, I found myself. And I know that my mission now in life, until I'm 90, that's when I've decided to retire. I'm gonna wear lots more bigger, bigger glasses, even bigger earrings, lots of you know necklaces and a glass of wine in hand. Um, and that's what I'm gonna do when I'm 90. But for now, my mission is to help everybody start a business doing what they love because Quite frankly, what I have seen over the last 20 years is that this makes people incredibly happy. And I'd like to help people live their fullest lives being happy. Um, at Holly & Co, um, I've decided that my missions, um, so these are the four things I'm gonna concentrate on over the next, um, oh, how long have I got? 50, no, that's, yeah, whatever, bad at maths, 46 years or whatever it is. I'm gonna help everyone build a business doing what they love. Um, I'd love to encourage everyone to vote with their money and sort of change the world. Um, female entrepreneurship, do we learn, you know, we don't learn it at school. We need to lift each other up, especially on International Women's Day. And I'd also love to help encourage children to walk a path less trodden, that they do not have to go down the university route, that they can be who they want to be, that there is a one in 400 billion chance of them being born and what is their diamond that they're going to um, shine on the world. And these are the areas I'm encouraged to build, um, you know, and I hope that my legacy will be, I've been able to move the dial in all of these areas um, in my lifetime. So I built Holly & Co. I thought, right, that's it. Um, the If you follow my Instagram, which is what I write on daily, um, I've just posted some stories. It's at Holly Tucker about me in 2013. And I look very different to what I do now. Uh, I ditched the high heels. I ditched the double spanks. I ditched the uh, tight dresses and I wore trainers. And basically my aim is to take the bullshit out of business. It is to um, make business something colorful, um, something that we don't keep talking about the imposter syndrome when we talk about business. And actually business is the most wonderful thing to get into. And I just feel like it's had bad PR basically. And it needs a big facelift ultimately. So. I have designed a world at Holly & Co where I have now recorded my 100th episode of my podcast, Conversations of Inspiration. Um, I have um, written a book, which I will talk about. This is actually the, um, this is a small business just designed this for me. It's called Do What You Love, Love What You Do. Um, and um, this is embroidered. Can, can I, I, I can still not get over this. Um, and where we have a shop, a physical shop, where we have a daily blog. I have networking events that are fantastic um, and always held in churches. Um, I run campaigns called Campaign Shop Independent. And ultimately, I am trying to bring colour, life, um, everything that women can bring business to the forefront. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to share with you um, sort of five lessons that I know to be true um, so far along this journey. And my first one is passion. Something that I've noticed with all of the entrepreneurs that I interview on Conversations of Inspiration, uh, Richard Reed, Joe Malone, Johnny Bowden, uh, Sir Tim Smith, uh, Liz Earle, uh, who else did I, uh, the founders of Pucker Tea, there are so many people. Passion is basically the fuel that underpins everything that we do. And actually passion and enthusiasm um, is one of the 
is vital things that I feel that women should have about whatever they do. But certainly if you find yourself in business or you have to be that person, um, you know, in your company, that passion is the number one business tool that you can have. You know, if you're not utterly passionate about something, then how on earth do you expect other people to be? I always call founders like the Duracell battery of their business. You know, they're, they're irreplaceable. They, they have this sort of energy. It's like a mother. And I always liken a business to being a mum. Not on the high streets, my first business baby. All the men in grey suits can bear me saying that, but oh well. Um, you know, that's fine. My first business baby was not on the high street. My second business baby is Holly and Co. And I will care for it and talk about it like I do my son, um, who is now, by the way, 16 years old. Uh, you know, he was three months old when I started not on the high street and he was my best man at my wedding uh, this past September. Um, be emotional in your marketing. One of the most unbelievable things I have seen is this inability to connect with your customers. It's something I think women are phenomenal at. If I would say that that is one of our superpowers, we are already emotional creatures. We already have empathy as a real value. And yet I don't necessarily see, uh, well, I don't see larger corporations doing it because actually normally they're run by men and they don't they lack the ability to understand how to connect with their female customer if we think that you know 95 percent of the money that is disposable is spent by this female ceo in the household then why aren't we tapping in to becoming emotionally connected um, at holly and co all i can do is try and lead by example everything that i do is vulnerable and honest. Um, it puts my heart on my sleeve out there and everything is tied up together. So you can come and visit the shop. Um, you can talk to those who work at the shop. You can then come to the Congregation of Inspiration, listen to the gospel choir um, as Fern Cotton comes off the stage and, um, you know, um, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, the black farmer comes on stage. You can then come to my Instagram where I try and show the real vulnerability of being a female um, empowered owner of a business. And if you can see, I try and connect all of these elements together. And I think that this is going to be the future. I think that we're going to become busier and busier as we get more teched up. Um, but actually, I think that we will still be um, those who will spend the disposable income. And actually, we want to feel like we're connected with our companies. We want to feel that they have values. We want to feel that we're actually part of their journey. And I think that this is really missing. So it's a real tip, I would say, because I think that not many people do this well. Um, find your community. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Um, this is something that I utterly believe in. Uh, this is an image from when I brought my podcast live around the country. Uh, I was uh, interviewing Mark Constantine from Lush and I was in Harrogate. Um, and it was just unbelievable. And this is everybody with their hand up. And we say the pledge. We're pledging basically to be of fullest versions of ourselves, and I have everyone stand up and everyone cringes and we all read it out and at the end I say our men and then I shout out our women and we all shout out the same and ultimately you know it is one of the things that has kept me going on every bad day that I have even though I feel a bit tiggery today I know I do but I'm excited to talk to you all um this community of small businesses that I um cheerlead on um, are the wind beneath my wings and I do think that that is another amazing tip and tool and aren't we lucky to have social media and groups that we can join especially during this period of time that we've gone through where we can find our fellow person be it a niche club that you want to that you're all into calligraphy or you're all into birds or you're into a book club or whatever it is or if it's a business or an industry um i think that it is amazing um i don't know why there's two red stripes that just appeared over that slide i don't know if anyone else sees that it's like my my niece is in here with a my apple pen anyway who knows um oh there they are again um 
So celebrating your milestones. For me, um, I was lucky enough um, to receive an MBE back in 2014. And that for me was a moment in time where I certainly don't think I'd ever smelt the roses up until then. We started not in the high street in 2006. I was always in a hurry. I was always looking forward. I was never looking back. I was always disappointed. On launch day of anything, you sort of didn't want to be around me because I would always be critiquing what we hadn't done, not what we had done. And so now at Holly & Co, one of the things that I'm trying to install in my team is that we do take the time that we do understand the moments that are fantastic because it sounds a little bit like a Pinterest quote that you would share, but ultimately I really do know that this is nothing to do with the destination. I have no destination at this point in time. My day is my destination and I try and live with gratitude and try and pull out of my day every little bit of a milestone. Um, today we shared on Instagram um, the strong woman pose where I'm trying to recreate, you know, that World War II rosy image. And it's actually called hashtag female founders unite. And I'm just watching the community flood in with this image because ultimately, did you know that female founders, women who run small businesses pump in 85 billion pounds into the economy every single year. And yet we still don't really talk about this. So I've now shared this um, image and uh, I urge you all to do it as well. Um, but actually that for me will be a milestone today. Tonight I will lie in bed, even though I tell my son not to do exactly what I'm doing. I will lie there looking through the screen and I will look at all these images of women with kids on their arms and trying to work and trying to do these things. And it's amazing. So today will be a milestone moment for me. And lastly, um, but not least, um, I've learned this the hard way for sure. You know, my insecurities as I built not in the high street, not being a woman from tech, launching a tech business, hiring all people that I thought would know better than me, oh, only to find out that basically they didn't. Um, and actually, you know, my gut was always telling me the truth. Um, it was always my internal compass. And that is something I cannot stress enough for you. You have a gut for a reason. And that is your absolute intuition. And it is incredibly powerful. It's what we actually always used to live on, actually, before smartphones and before uh, humankind and the way that we live now. We used to have gut. And that's how we used to run our lives. And I would urge us all to remember that that's the reason that you have that inner voice. Um, and certainly now I don't do it, I don't do it perfectly, but I absolutely urge my team and urge myself to listen to what um, you're being told internally and to act upon it. And my last thing, even though God knows why I have these two red lines across these screens, but um, is um, that you have 29,000 days on this planet. Um, I was 40 when I worked this out. Um, I, I sort of, uh, like all women, we're, all, we're, we're quite efficient, aren't we, in our time? So I was trying to be efficient. And I thought to myself, right, how many years have I got left on this planet so that I can just sort of get to grips with this? And, um, and I, I, I worked out that you had 29,000 days roughly on the planet, but actually it was worse news. I realized I had 14,000 days left on my 40th. And when you start to know this, it really does give you a focus that whatever's happening in your life, if you are unhappy, if you've not pursued your dreams, that you have got to go for it, that we don't know about tomorrow, but we do know that this isn't indefinite and that we have to live our truest selves and our truest lives. Um, and actually that's why um, one of the re reasons I wrote this book, Do What You Love, Love What You Do, is I wanted to try and encapsulate, you know, why we have to act um, and make sure that we're building something that makes us happy or we're in a profession that brings the most out of us because we don't have any time really to waste. Um, that's me. And thank you so much for listening. You can follow me um, at Holly Tucker. As I said, I'd love to see your your poses today. It would be absolutely awesome. And um, thank you very much um, for listening to me. Thank you.
Thank you, Holly. Um, thank you for sharing your story and what, um, what an inspiring story and journey you've had. Um, yeah, that, that was really great to hear, but I must admit, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I feel about your last comment. You know, we have 29,000 days on this planet because I quickly got my calculator out <laughs> and worked out that I've only got 6,205 left. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's interesting though, Joe, isn't it? Because it sort of sharpens the mind, yes, you know. Yes. And, and someone once told me, you can never unknow what you now know. Yes. And even though you sort of wish you don't know that, in a way, it's also incredibly empowering to know it. Yeah. And, I, and I think what's really important was your fifth comment there. And, and I can so resonate with that. Your comment was, trust your gut. As you say, trust your gut is your internal compass. Um, and, and, and that is just so true. But um, one, one question for me, Holly, um, you know, you've achieved so much. Um, you know, you, you really have achieved a lot. What do you think your next chapter will be? If I'm truly honest with you, if I could have the day like I'm having today for the next 40 years, I will be the happiest I can be. I actually don't think I'm striving for anything more than doing what I'm doing. Waking up in the morning, I absolutely adore what I do. I hope to build it. I hope to change more people's lives. Um, I hope to write more books. I hope to do more events. I hope to do more podcasts. I hope to do all these things. But if I'm truly honest with you, I think that this is what I wish for everybody is, I, if I can be doing what I do today, in 40 years time, then I, I'm going to be an incredibly fortunate person. I to totally agree with it. And, I, and, I, and one thing I can say to you, having been at the chamber for 30, so over 30 years now, those 40 years will come around very quickly, Holly. So, yes. <laughs> so plan what it is you want to do with them. So I will. Does, does anybody have a question? Um, it, we, we've just got a few minutes. Um, so if anybody has a question that they want to, to ask Holly, please do put it in the chat. Um, but one thing in the chat, Holly, Catherine Stevens has, has put passion in uh, agreeing with you that passion and enthusiasm is so important. But people can often interpret this as, as she puts, gobbiness. And she's been judged for this, but she still thinks it's key. Did you've got a comment on that? Oh, yeah. You know, I, you know, gobby, whatever you want to call it, it's absolutely fantastic. You know, if you don't believe in yourself, I, also I'd go as far as to say it's not just gobby. People think passion is almost like enthusiasm. It's almost you're trying to make up for a lack of IQ or a lack of ability or a lack of, do you want know I mean, knowledge? And I really think that that's what people think. You know, you've got that big smile and you're all like this. Well, you obviously don't know what you're doing. And I think that that is exactly the point. Let that actually be your strength. Go in and be gobby and be that person and then sock it to them with what you do know. Right. And, and you'll take them disarmed as well. It's what I, I laugh at. You know, I went to number 10 and I walked in with this. Um, oh, I can show you, actually. I walked in with this picture. Can you see this? Like that. And I walked, this was International Women's Day. And I walked in with a T-shirt supporting women with glitter trainers. And I got all the looks in the world when I walked in there. But actually, in the end of the day, I was able to be enthusiastic. I knew I was being my true self. And people were drawn to that. That's it. You know, we are only but human. We're drawn to it. And so that's why I think find your flock find your tribe, find those people, because they won't think that you're gobby. They'll just think that you're really magical and, and have something about you. Thank you, Holly. So what, what we'll say to Kathleen from all of us is you go girl, you keep being gobby and continue to keep making a difference. So um, so one, fi one final question, so I, I see what the time is. Um, and uh, that, that question um, is, let me just have a quick so I can read it, yeah. What one thing, Holly, do you do every day to get your mindset in the right place? Well, actually, I used to not be able to answer this question because before lockdown, um, I sort of didn't have any, 
sort of thing that I did. And now I would say that certainly this last year, I think because I've been able to get off the adrenaline treadmill, and I know, I'm sure many of you understand exactly what I'm talking about there. I've been able to maybe for the first time in my career center myself. So there's a few things that I do. I go for a walk religiously every single day um, and that and, and listen to a podcast that has really helped me have some me time. Um, I've also started to read one chapter a book every day. So I'm not one because if I start reading at night, I don't know about you. I'm dead to the world. I'm just literally out like a light and I can't be that person. So I've now in the day, I've done this thing where I read a chapter in the daytime, one chapter, that's it. Um, and also I've been able to, um, well, I found that actually this time has been amazing to connect with people. So being able to connect with my community, um, long live Zoom as far as I'm concerned. I want to meet people in person, but I, I'm sure you all agree. I've been able to meet people all over the country at the drop of a hat who I never would have met before. And so that is something that I'm doing much more of is connecting with people, probably on a daily basis. I know those are three things, but yes. there you are. <laughs> That's great, three is fine. I'm just proud I have something to say there and not just, I just run around like a blue ass fly all day. <laughs> I don't know, Holly, in the short time that I've met you this morning, I, I think what would probably, uh, in fact, put what's the one thing that gives you your daily enthusiasm and passion? I'd say it's just waking up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you very much on behalf of us all for, for taking the time out oh, thank uh, to you come for having and me. do this today and share your story um, and you keep on all the good work so oh. thank you holly thank happy you. international women's day everyone <laughs> see you later see you. bye everyone bye bye well, she was certainly a force of nature. Um, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce our, our next speaker, and that's uh, Professor Karen Cox, uh, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Kent. Um, again, I, I, I'm very fortunate to, to be able to work alongside Karen as we, we have a very close relationship uh, between the Chamber and the University of Kent. But also um, on boards I sit on with the Kent and Meadow Economic Partnership and the Southeast Local Enterprise Partnership. So Karen's here to share with us this morning her journey. So I won't talk any more about what I know about Karen. Uh, I'll leave her to talk for herself. So over to you, Karen. Well, well, well thanks, Joe, And um, happy uh, International Women's Day to, to everybody here. Um, I, I, uh, I think it's always uh, tough when you have to go last because <laughs> you've got to you've got to live up to uh, everything that's been shared already. So um, I will uh, attempt to do that. But I'm also aware that um, Joe and I agreed we, we'd leave a bit of time for questions. So I'll, I'll speak for a while and then we'll, we'll leave some time before midday, I think, uh, is when the session finishes so that hopefully we can engage in a bit of a conversation. Um, so a little bit about uh, me then. I thought what I'd do is, is sort of say a little bit about what, what I'm doing um, now, um, just very briefly as a sort of introduction, but, but then sort of, I suppose, take, take you back to, to where I've come from and some of the things that, that I've learned uh, uh, along the way. So uh, as I've been introduced, I am a Vice Chancellor and President of, of the University of Kent, and I, I joined the university in August 2017. And um, I have to say a huge thank you to Joe for making me feel incredibly welcome into the, the county of, of Kent. And um, it's, it's a, been a real pleasure getting, getting to know her. Um, but um, one of the things I, I wanted to share was that um, you know, becoming a vice chancellor was uh, not on my sort of career list when I was five years old. Um, I would not have even known and, and didn't for a long time know what, even what a vice chancellor was. I suppose the best way to describe it is you are in effect the, the chief executive officer of, of the, the organization, the university, the, the business that, that you are running. And, and I do see it as a, a business. We are, of course, not a, a, a kind of corporate commercial entity. We don't have shareholders, but we do need to operate as a, as a business. And so um, I suppose I, I am also um, managing a, a significant budget. It's a big operation. We have nearly 20,000 students, 3,000 staff, a turnover of 270 million, and campuses across Kent, Medway, and, and into Europe. So I find myself in a role that um, was not necessarily where I started uh, from in terms of a career, 
Um, I actually um, started off as a clinical nurse. I was a, a registered cancer and palliative care nurse. I still am a registered nurse. Um, and it's interesting the twists and turns that um, can take you from one place to, to the next. So a little bit about my journey then from, from I suppose, registered nurse to, to vice chancellor. So I grew up um, in the north, um, just outside Leeds, uh, in a place called Pudsey, which you might know from the um, uh, Children in Need appeal. Um, I grew up on a council estate and my parents worked for uh, West Yorkshire Foundries. But of course, I grew up in the sort of born in 69, grew up in the 70s and, and quite a, a tumultuous time for, for the UK. And my father was made redundant um, when I was about 10, I think. Um, and they took a, a, a massive decision um, to move from where we were living, at council estate, I went to a local comprehensive, um, to, to the Yorkshire Dales to set up. Um, my dad decided he was going to set up on his own, um, cleaning windows, painting, decorating, um, gardening. My mum uh, cleaned houses. Um, and when I look back on that, I, I kind of think what an amazing thing that they did at that time. They really, you know, made a massive decision. And when I'm sort of faced sometimes with, with decisions, I sort of think, well, actually, it was probably this is nowhere near what, what my parents had to do. Um, and, and I think I've been shaped very much by some of the choices that, that they've made. So, so we moved to the Yorkshire Dales. I went to the local school there. Um, and it was there on a work experience um, opportunity that I... Uh, went to the local hospital. I was very interested in uh, biology. I thought I wanted to work in one of the labs. Um, I ended up uh, on a week's work placement and found myself one day going up onto the wards with the phlebotomist taking bloods. And I remember thinking, ah, this is where I want to be. I want to be where people are, what's happening to people here? How can I be involved in this world? Um, I, I then decided that that it was nursing that I wanted to do. Um, the school I was at though only went up to a, a fifth form. So I went to a further education college to do my A-levels um, because at this point um, I needed to, to think about um, my A-levels so I could get in to do nursing. Um, it was though at the FE college where I also went to night school to do one of my A-levels that I um, was encouraged to think about university as well. Um, and I, again, it's, I think one of the things that my story um, illustrates is significant individuals along the way who encouraged me to, to think about something and, and make a choice I might not have made um, without them. So it was, it was my tutors really at FE College that encouraged me to think about university. None of my parents or any family members had, had been to university. Um, I, I, I didn't really know what, what it was about. But um, over time, thinking about that and combining it with the opportunity to do nursing at university meant that I um, chose to um, study uh, a nursing degree and um, ended up at King's College London. Um, it was London I wanted to go to. Um, I think that's one of those things. I think if you've grown up in, in just outside Leeds and then in the Yorkshire Dales, London seems uh, glamorous and attractive. And, uh, and whilst, of course, it is, it's not quite the same, is it, when you actually get there? So I, I had um, four fantastic years at uh, King's in London and, um, and it was at being at university really that opened up uh, a world for me that I had never imagined was out there in terms of opportunities, thinking differently, um, thinking about where I might go and live and work after university. But I was really inspired by the people I met there. And, and I suppose it sowed a seed of, well, actually, if I could ever work in a university, and teach and research like my tutors are doing, who are teaching and, and, and um, supporting and educating me, then that's something I, I'd quite like to do. But as I graduated, I, um, decide, I'd already decided that I wanted to specialise in cancer and palliative care. For me, it's an area of healthcare where you can be involved in the whole range from screening through to diagnosis support. And of course, unfortunately, from time to time, supporting people as they face having to deal with a terminal illness and needing to support them and their families through uh, a bereavement. Um, but for me as a nurse, that was an area that I was completely fascinated by. So I graduated in 91 and worked clinically for a number of years. But um, 
I'd say it was probably a couple of years in um, that I had decided actually, whilst I loved the clinical work, I wanted to get back to some kind of uh, intellectual challenge alongside that clinical work. Um, and through a series of uh, opportunities and, and applications ended up at the University of Nottingham um, on a, well, it was initially on a one year contract um, where they were, I was partly um, employed on a clinical contract and partly on a, a research contract to put together an application to try and get some funding for, for a PhD. Um, I, I really didn't intend to be there that long. I thought I'd do this one year and then if I got the PhD, uh, I'd be there for another three or four. But I ended up at the University of Nottingham for 23 years, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, they offered me every opportunity. But um, in those early years, I, I, um, I applied for a, a National Nursing Research Fellowship and, and ended up getting it that year, which was 95. Um, and then that funded me to do my PhD. And I think that really was, was a turning point for me. Again, um, my supervisors were, were just so encouraging and, and made me think about taking opportunities as they came along. So I ended up spending some time at the University of Pennsylvania towards the end of my um, PhD studies. Um, and and that, that opportunity meant that later on in my career, um, I was able to spend some time in, in uh, Yale uh, University because my supervisor at University of Pennsylvania had since moved to Yale. And, and I suppose, again, I share that as a, a way of saying you never quite know how the networks, the friendships, the people that you meet might well be um, people that, again, offer you opportunity and support, which for me was 10 years later. Um, and I will never forget that. And what a great opportunity that was. Um, I remained at Nottingham and um, absolutely loved it. I, I finished my PhD, became a lecturer, a senior lecturer and a professor. I was very fortunate for me, that happened very, very quickly. Um, I completed my PhD in 99 and by 2002, at the age of 32, I was promoted to, to professor. Um, I always say that I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, nursing was expanding in universities and uh, they were looking for people to, to take on roles who, who were up for taking on challenges. Um, and, and I happened, as I say, to be in the right place at the right time. But again, I do think there is something about feeling able to take opportunities. And I was interested in listening to Jo um, about the, the opportunities that, that present themselves and do you feel confident enough or not to take them. And one of the things that I think was a turning point for me around leadership and developing as a, as a leader was that I was asked to take on the role of acting head of the School of Nursing at Nottingham just initially for six weeks. And I remember at the time I was on a, a leadership programme and I was moaning about this saying, oh, you know, I've got all this work to do. I'm doing my research, my teaching. How can I possibly take on this role? And, and yet I was moaning about other things that were happening. We should do this, we should do that. And somebody just turned around to me and said, well, Karen, stop moaning about it. Do the, do the role for a bit and you can, make it, you can make a difference. And I remember thinking it was a bit of a sort of cold flannel to the face thinking, Actually, yeah, okay, they're right. I should, I should just get on and, and do this. And in the end, the six weeks turned to uh, a year, and then that year turned to the full um, head of school role um, from 2002 to, to 2007. Um, and I think it was during that time that I um, realised I absolutely loved what I was doing. I loved developing the school, the people, working with students, working with staff, but also understanding much more about how the university was operating. Um, and it was during that period that I decided that actually I'd quite like to, to think about university leadership out with my particular discipline. Um, so I um, indicated to, to one or two people, I had some fantastic mentors within the university that I was potentially interested in that route. And um, fortunate to have a, a sabbatical during 2007 to 2008 when I was approached by the the then vice chancellor at Nottingham about taking on a what were then called pro vice chancellor roles which in, a, in effect sort of director roles within that university senior leadership team and I, I couldn't believe that I was being asked to asked to do this and uh, and I just I just thought what a wonderful wonderful opportunity and, and interestingly they they said to me well you need to take the weekend to think about it and I thought no I don't I'm going to do this now this is amazing 
And so I was going, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. And they're going, no, no, you need to just take some time to think about it. I was like, no, I said, no, seriously, think about it over the weekend. So um, again, a, a story short, I, I joined the senior leadership team at Nottingham as a pro vice chancellor in 2008, um, and then became the deputy vice chancellor in 2013. Um, and what a, what a fantastic um, training and development opportunity that was to learn about um, how the organization worked, managing large budgets, managing people, trying to remain true to a mission. Um, and it was during that period that I decided that if I was going to do the, the top job, I needed to look outside the university. I'd been there a long time and I wanted to, to challenge myself a little bit. And, um, and, and so once you've kind of, I think, made that sort of choice, I, I when I was approached about headhunters approach, as we all know, and, and, um, and I decided when I was asked about Kent to, to throw my hat into the ring um, and, and ultimately ended up here in, in August 2017. But interestingly, I, I mean, I have two, two children. I married, I married uh, mid nineties. Um, I had my daughter when I was on my first trip to the States. Um, I thought I better get, I, I was pregnant. So I thought, oh gosh, I better go to the States and do this study opportunity at, at Pennsylvania. Cause once I've got this babe, that's gonna be harder. Um, and, and then I had my son in, in 2003. And um, interesting, when we came to Kent, of course, Ollie um, was a, a school age and, um, and would be coming with us. And when he told his, oh, this really struck me, when he told his school that he was going to be leaving, uh, we were going down to Kent, but the, the teacher turned and said, oh, has your dad got a new job? <laughs> and bless him, he said, no, it's my mum. And I don't know why you asked me that question. <laughs> I always kind of thought he was, so great for, for both recognizing the, the kind of bizarreness of the question, but also responding in the way that you did. So I, um, I find myself here, been here nearly, well, three and a half years now. Um, absolutely love it. Um, I feel like a round peg in a round hole. Um, it's challenging. There are times when I have been um, really, you know, kind of what am I doing here? I, you know, this is this is just, you know, beyond experience that I've had before. Um, but I think I found that actually there are ways that you can work through things. You've got mentors, you've got support. Um, that actually, you know, the world won't stop spinning if you don't know the answer to something. Um, buy yourself some time. Um, and, and I think I found um, in this role a, a greater resilience than, than I ever have had. And um, I, I'm just so grateful actually that I've had the opportunity. It's a huge privilege uh, for me working in, in education and, and higher education, being involved in really genuinely transforming people's lives, but also working with partners and in, in, in different sectors um, as we work, I think very much um, as part of a community. And for me, universities are absolutely rooted in the communities in which they're based. Um, and we should be um, really thinking about the role that we play and, and how we can genuinely influence um, people's lives. So hugely proud to, to, to be in the role that I'm in. Um, I'm also still hugely proud that I'm a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also currently I was on the board of the Nursing Midwifery Council, which is the UK register and regulator for all nurses and midwives across the, the UK, some 720 odd thousand of them. Um, and I'm currently the acting chair of that board um, because the, the, the current chair, unfortunately, is, is, is ill. But again, um, what, what a thing to be chairing the regulator of, of your profession. And uh, I, 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 I can't quite believe I'm, I'm able to do that as well. So I am. Um, I thoroughly enjoy what I do. Um, I would strongly encourage anybody to, to kind of think beyond where you know, they started out and hey, you never know where you might end up. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, but in terms of lessons learned, for me, it's you know, making use of, of mentors, um, taking opportunities as they present themselves, um, keeping positive, and as my husband says, think about the golden present, Karen, not always the golden future, because uh, I have a tendency to kind of sometimes think, think too far ahead. Um, and then the other thing that I, I absolutely treasure is a quote that um, we had a, a, a speaker come to um, Nottingham who um, was ex 
chair of the uh, chief exec, sorry, of the NSPCC, a woman called Mary Marsh. She's done and, and done other things. But I remember her saying that three things that, that really resonated for me, that, that the best things about I'm trying to, to kind of live up to being a leader are to know yourself, be yourself and look after yourself. And when I'm talking to colleagues and friends and, and, and students, I always add and enjoy yourself at the end. So I think I'll finish there. Um, as I say, huge privilege to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to, to speak uh, this, this morning and uh, hope that's been of some help uh, along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I mean, what a fantastic journey you've been on. Um, and I've got to say, well done to your son. Absolutely. <laughs> I would have been so proud of him. Absolute great response there. And, and actually, you know, your last comments there, actually, look after yourself and enjoy yourself. So important. So important to enjoy what you're doing. You know, I, I was always brought up with, you know, two things. You know, if you're going to do a job, do it properly or don't do it at all. It's probably my strict military upbringing. That's what I had. And the other one is, you know, you only get one shot at life. It's not a dummy run. So make sure you do what you enjoy. So, yeah, I, I, th I think they're two, two really good comments there. I've got lots of questions and we're, we've got seven minutes. So I, I, I'll, I'll try, try and put them in some sort of order here. And I'll put mine last just in case we don't get time. Um, so uh, Catherine Stevens has put, um, how have you managed having kids and running such a high profile role? Did you ever feel that being a mum held you back? Um, so, so no, I don't think uh, being a mum held me back. Um, and I think it's one of those things, and I think Joe, you said it, you just get on with it, don't you? Somebody, somebody said you just get on with it. So. I do remember when I had M and, uh, and and she was at nursery. So I was, uh, I think I was still just finishing my period or I just finished my period, just, just started lecturing. And um, and I remember saying to my mum, oh, you know, I feel really guilty. I, I'm not sure if she'll know me and should I be doing this? And, da, da, da. and my mum just looked at me and said, Karen, are you happy? And I said, well, at work. And I said, well, yes. And she said, well, if you're happy, she'll be happy. And that's all there is to it. So get on with it. So I remember thinking, oh, right, OK. <laughs> and, um, and, and I suppose, again, I've been really fortunate with my career. I, 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 I went back very quickly after having the kids. Um, and that was a personal choice. And I would never tell anyone how to manage their, their children and, and how they wish to manage maternity leave, paternity leave, shared parental leave, all of that good stuff. But I do think shared parental leave is a massive step forward and it's one of the things I'm really keen on supporting here at, at the university. Um, but I think for me it's been about making sure that they're happy, um, everybody kind of gets on with it. Um, yeah, and and I don't feel it's, it's how, in many ways I think they've helped me um, be a happier person um, kept my feet on the ground. I'm so, you know, interested to see what they do, how they do it, and, and their kind of feedback around what's happening in their lives. Um, all, all of that, I, genuinely, I, I found, again, inspirational um, as to how they get, get on with things. So I've not felt it's hard. It's not to say it's not been hard. There haven't been days when I felt like I've been in a bit of a fog, having buggy jogged home, from, uh, you know, pick them up from nursery, had to leg it home to pick the other one up from the childminder and you get in and just think, what am I doing? But all that aside, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Right. And uh, somebody else has put, the move from Nottingham to Kent is a huge gear shift. How did you, did you find it challenging? I think um, it's interesting in that, uh, so I look back on it now and I'm so glad we made the move. It was, it's energising um we the quality of life here is great you know that it's a lovely place to live so so all of that looking back I don't again a great move um at the time I think we um I mean I talked about it of course with with Dunk and um it was one of those things where I think we both decided look I've been at Nottingham a long time probably gone as far as I could I got this great opportunity and I, we just looked at either and said let's just do it it'll be an adventure our daughter was about to go off to university. Ollie said he was up for coming. You know, he, he did tell us, again, as well as the teacher comment, that his mates had been going, oh, tell him you're not going to go. Just, 
you know, so you're going <laughs> to, and he said to them, no, 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 I, I you know, I, I'm going to go, you know, it's going to be interesting. And whilst he had a bit of a wobble the first few weeks at school, he's been great. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, big change but to move, sell everything. We've got a new place here, but I wouldn't, again, I, I, it was um, something I sometimes think, oh, I wish we'd done that a bit sooner, actually. I think it never hurts to actually keep moving. I, I think, you know, uh, from personal experience, my father was in the army. I moved to England when I was 15. Um, and actually, uh, up until I was 18, we literally, I think the longest we ever lived anywhere was two years because we were constantly moving from country to country. Um, and I think actually it does you good. It makes you more resilient. So I, I yeah, think actually yeah. it's, it, it's good. So yeah. saying yeah. that, my children were both born in Ashford and they both live there now. <laughs> Hey, never mind. Um, actually, talking back about children, um, Ellie Moore put something really interesting I just want to share in the chat. And that was being an inspirational woman doesn't just have to be in a work environment, because as a mother, inspiring the next generation is also very important. And, and you know, I, and, and I'm sure Karen agrees, couldn't agree with you more there, Ellie, with, with, with that one. So one, one for me, Karen, you're relatively young to be a vice chancellor of the university, let alone one of the country's larger universities. As I asked Holly, where do you see your next chapter? Uh, well, I'm not that, I mean, I'm 51 now. And um, so, so it's not that young. Although, although, yes, you're right. I mean, in leadership positions for, for a long time now, and sometimes you sort of think, well, what, what do I want to do? I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a, a kind of game plan. Um, I've decided as long as I'm enjoying what I'm doing, I'll, I'll keep doing that. Um, and who knows what opportunities might be around the corner. So I, I don't have, as long as I'm doing something that I feel passionate about, motivated by, um, and things that keep keep being interesting, then um, yeah, I'll keep doing that. As soon as it's International Women's Day, I'm gonna share this one with you. So somebody's put, wow, Karen, you don't look 51. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've got one final question. And this is from Carol, Carol Barron. So uh, the number of women on the top FTSE boards is growing. What can we do to encourage women to have the courage to put themselves forward for these types of positions? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I don't think women lack courage. And, and I don't think it's... Um, I think it's still it's still a sort of culture and systems issue, and and um, and I think that that's the stuff that we need to be challenging. So it's not about sending all women off on leadership courses or you know development programs or, or saying it's the women's fault. Actually, it's the systems we should be challenging. It's cultures we should be challenging, and that's the stuff we should be pushing at. Um, and and um, you know I, I think just listening to the the stories that you and 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 Holly told you know it, it is that kind of when you see it challenge it um, and then you know we, we we're not saying it's going to change overnight but I I do think it's actually about the the going for the systems and the culture and and changing the policy piece and I mean you know the the parental leave thing. Uh, you, you, you know you've got to have the same opportunities and it can't just be well you can you know just women you can just uh, take maternity leave well actually why, why can't men have paternity leave on the same terms and conditions so you get paid you get the leave um so it's that stuff that's going to change it um, but it is about i think as well encouraging anybody to feel that you know they have they have a right to be there um and it's not somebody's not just doing you a favor you've got something to bring and you can make a difference and i think it's encouraging all of that that we need to do Thank you, Karen. I think I ought to leave it there now because it's, it's gone 12 o'clock. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your story with us this morning. And, and you keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank, thank you, Karen. It's a pleasure to work with you. Thanks for making <laughs> me feel so welcome. You've just been absolutely wonderful. So, thank you. And, and thanks for the questions. It's uh, great to talk. Thank you. thank you. Right, everybody. We started off by saying that we're going to have a competition. So, um, Holly has signed three of her books. So uh, it's the first person to put the answer in the chat. Uh, so for each question, we'll win the book. So the first question, this shows how much you're all listening. So the first question is, what year was I awarded my OBE? 
Oh, straight in there. <laughs> I've got to go back and find the first one now. Yeah, I've got it there. So is it Abby is our first our winner yet? So we've been that game. So we'll make sure, Abby, uh, that you get the book. Um, well done. You are all listening. Well, a few of you weren't, but most of you were. So um, the next question is from Holly's talk. Holly described trusting your gut as following your internal what? And I think Elspeth Dunn is the first one in your internal compass. Well done. And the last one. What year did Karen join the University of Kent? And the first one is Debbie Kemp, 2017. Well done, Debbie. So yeah, so you will all get your 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 signed copy of, of Holly's book. So um, I'm afraid I've overrun by a couple of minutes, but you know I just want to just take the final few minutes really just to to say um, you know you've heard from three of us this morning. It uh, doesn't mean we're any more inspiring than anyone else. Um, it's just you know we wanted three people to start, share, share their story. All of your individual stories are just as inspiring. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, I started off by saying, you know, the one thing that, that, you know, I know we've got is we've got some fantastic entrepreneurial women um, in, in Kent. And, you know, as somebody said in the chat, doesn't have to be in a work environment it's a mindset it can also be in your home environment so so keep doing what you're doing uh, really enjoy international women's day um, and just lovely to see you all and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully catch up with you all uh, at some point soon so for me and from all of our speakers uh, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully see you all soon thank you <laughs>